Good afternoon. It is uh, one bell of the afternoon watch, and this is your Captain Joe up in the captain's chair for our regular and weekly visit in the around the captain's chair. And uh, this week, uh, I have a, a new friend, a friend that I had never met before, and uh, she is a second mate in our merchant marine. So not knowing how this one is going to go, it will be an interesting program for all of us, and I hope for Madeline Walsko as well. So Madeline, uh, you are welcome around the captain's chair, and uh, so I'm going to start off. Before we get into my regular features, such as the binnacle list, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself, tell us, uh, and in particular, uh, tell me where you did your undergraduate work and your training. Okay. Hi, I am Madeline Walchko. Um, I graduated from California Maritime Academy in 2015. Um, I did my cadet shipping in the Gulf of Mexico with Edison Schwest offshore. Um, and then just the training vessel, uh, the training ship Golden Bear as well. Um, and yeah, graduated in 2015, um, pretty much immediately, uh, joined the Union International Organization of Masters, Mates, and Pilots, um, and that's where I've been ever since, working off the board uh, with the union. Um, so I've been working with uh, APL, Matson, uh, Patriot, and those are the companies I've worked for so, so far. So why did you select Cal Maritime? And I know where it is. I've been by it many times, and I'm very familiar with at least three versions of Golden Bear. Mm -hmm. But uh, why did you select uh, Cal Maritime? Um, it was, I mean, it's the only Maritime Academy to get a unlimited third mate's license on the West Coast. So that was huge. I was able to acquire a specific, um, scholarship called the WUI, um, that you can get on the West Coast for, um, if you're an out of state student. So that was super helpful. Um, and yeah, I I didn't really know uh, what I wanted to do with my life until junior year of high school, which I guess for people in my generation, that's pretty good. <laughs> yes. Um, but my my eldest brother is a naval architect and marine engineer. He went to Webb Institute. And um, so I was kind of exposed to shipping um, from that point of view, as well as just growing up in the Seattle area. Um, growing up around ships and the port and in Tacoma as well. And um, uh, I also grew up on a Hudson Force 50 sailboat. So there was just a lot of kind of nautical <laughs> upbringing. Um, so it was kind of the best option. Um, I went to a college fair and was thinking about going into the Coast Guard, actually, um, or the Navy or, you know, I didn't really understand um, at that time that merchant being a merchant marine was something that a person could do um so i met the president of the alumni association at the time ken posse um at that college fair and he convinced me that being um a merchant marine was the best option so i went that route so i've got um a number of uh, other questions and uh, comments mm -hmm as we go through our time together, but as I briefed you before we got started this afternoon, I'm going to get into some of my regular features. Yeah. And as I get into those, uh, you are welcome to make any comment that you would like to make, even if you believe that you don't know anything about that particular subject, because uh, we often pontificate from the captain's chair about subjects that we may not really know much about, but mm -hmm. we talk about anyway. So, as always, I get into the binnacle list. And last week, one of the things that I talked about on the binnacle list was um, people, Captain Joe's people all over the world. And we do, in fact, broadcast all over the world from Singapore on one side of the world to the Kingdom of Sweden and Stockholm on the other. 
on the Voice of Vashon, 101.9 on the FM band, broadcasting just onto the Magical Isle because the 101.9 is something like 5 watts, which doesn't get very far, but streaming live on voiceofvashon.org all over the world to Captain Joe's people in those places and all of the ships and aircraft that are operating. And now, because we have a friend who is a mate in our merchant marine, also to all of the merchant ships, thousands of merchant ships underway all over the world. And you can look at where they are and who they are by going on to marine traffic. And in fact, I have a marine traffic report a little bit uh, later on. So for the binnacle list last week, we talked about in particular uh, Captain Joe's people who were being challenged by uh, mental and emotional problems because the binnacle list isn't just for people who are physically ill. And I also reported that uh, my house was on the binnacle list because I had no water. <laughs> but since then, the leak has been located, has been uh, plugged with uh, a suitable damage control plugging and patching kit, which I don't think is going to hold for the 50 years that I have left to live in that house. But at least I've got water again and the other concern that we had was putting the entire Pacific Northwest on the binnacle list for because we'd had no rain. And since then, we have had some rain, which to a sailor is a free freshwater washdown. And That's right. uh, yes, what do you think about that, <laughs> mate? Yeah, um, I've been in some good squalls where, right. you know, you, go, you head straight for them and that's right. You head straight for them, yep. and if you're carrying aircraft, mm -hmm. you launch the aircraft and you fly them through the fresh water to nice. get the uh, the salt because rotor heads, helicopter rotor heads, are particularly susceptible to damage from salt. That makes well, sense. Well, it warms the cockles of this old sea captain's heart to hear that that in our merchant marine, the ships under the American flag deviate from their <laughs> track just a little bit to get some of that free fresh water That's because. Right. How do we get fresh water aboard ship, Madeline? Uh, you got to desalinate. That's right. You make it. Yeah. And you use fuel to make it. And especially in business, fuel conservation is a particularly uh, important thing. And I would imagine, in fact, I'll ask you the question. Does your training include such things as uh, fuel management and fuel consumption? Mm, very briefly. Um, that's kind of the engines engineers side of things, but, um, yeah, I mean, once you become captain, that's definitely something you're looking at to be on the good side of the company, but mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the tendency is to move away from, um, have you ever sailed in a steamship? I have. Okay. So, uh, then you have sailed in a steam. I was the captain of one of them where we used uh, black oil, Bunker mm -hmm. C. Mm -hmm. And um, if uh, you have a coupling failure, you have Bunker C not only all, all over the ship, which has to be cleaned, but it spills over and it's a really nasty product to have to clean up. Mm -hmm. What was the steamship that you sailed in? The Horizon Enterprise, <clears throat> which is still operating, actually. Yes, she survived your tender ministrations. <laughs> yeah. So right now you are a second mate. Yes. And uh, I happen to know that um, in setting this broadcast up that you were going to uh, get some training at uh, my tags, which is in Baltimore. It's in That's Lincoln. Correct. Yep. Not very far from Baltimore. And I, I was the captain of my icebreaker was home ported in the Coast Guard Yard in Curtis Bay, which is tucked around. Have you ever been, have you ever taken a ship in and out of uh, Baltimore? I have not. So uh, it is a particularly challenging port because it's a dredge port, unlike ours here. Mm. So uh, where are some of the ports that you have uh, been uh, made on the bridge when uh, you went in and out of that particular port? Mm, a lot of West Coast, so um, the Puget Sound um, with Matson that was down in Tacoma. Um, I have not come into Elliott Bay except for just in bridge simulation scenarios. Um, 
So San Francisco, Oakland area, LA, Long Beach, um, and then going around the world most recently, Yokohama, Japan, Naha, Okinawa, um, Busan, South Korea, uh, Qingdao, China, Shanghai, China, Singapore. Um, have you been Subic through Bay, the uh, Panama Canal? I have. That was um, on the training ship, actually. That's the only time I've been through the canal. Golden Bear. Yeah. So were you uh, able to be up on the bridge in Golden Bear when you went through the canal? I wasn't, actually. But I, you know, was awake. I think we went, we transited at night. And at that time, it was... Watches were kind of weird on the training ship because we were all rotating out. There's 500 students. So it's just, you know, you, you kind of are delegated wherever and you don't have like a set you have a week where you have a set watch and then it kind of rotates to classes and then that kind of thing so um since you are a license mate mm. and your licenses are issued by my service the mm -hmm. coast guard mm -hmm. And the subject of how license examinations are conducted has been a subject of discussion ever since the beginning of time. Yeah. Ever since man straddled the log and had to be licensed <laughs> in order to go to sea, yeah. uh, the who and the how of license examinations has uh, been the subject of a great deal of discussion. And I, I bring that up in particular today because in my review of, um, of G. Captain. Yeah, I came across an article and I'm going to ask for I'm going to read you just a little piece of it because okay. you're a busy young lady and you probably haven't had a chance to uh, to review G Captain for yourself this morning. Or I maybe did you not, have. In fact, I was running all morning long. All right. All right. So we're going to talk about that because uh, doing that aboard ship must present some real challenges. Mm -hmm. So in G Captain this morning, I had a letter or a message from. Um, uh, Captain um, Bradley Clare, commanding officer of the National Maritime Center. Now, you're familiar with the National Maritime Center because Indeed. that's how you work your license. Yep. And uh, um, Captain Clare, who is the commanding officer of the National Maritime Center, is advising me and in thus advising you, Madeline, because mm -hmm. you are a holder of a license and, mm -hmm. and uh, I am... I am not a holder of a license, nor do I have current time where I could acquire one, uh, that the Merchant Mariner user fee payment form, now get ready for this, because mm. this is important news mm. to you. <laughs> the, the user fee payment form has uh, been compromised, and many Merchant Mariners have paid too much. Oh, and so this is a procedure for you to get some of your money back. Now, where oh. are you in your uh, licensing process for first mate? Um, I have to take two more classes and then get approved by the Coast Guard to test and then I can test. Have, do you have all the sea time you need? Yes. And you have all of the other requirements met? Yep. Uh, when did you last go to firefighting school? I actually just went last month so you've got all of these requirements met yep so i am here by putting you on alert mm. that when you send in your money to the national maritime center to to take your license examination yep. be alert that you may be charged too much because that's what captain claire is telling us and telling you so i know that you're delighted to have all of that news <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, you will be uh, suitably aware of what's going on and that you not be uh, hoodwinked. Hoodwinked. By the Coast Guard. I like that. On your license <laughs> examinations. <laughs> so, uh, when do you, uh, was getting ready for your first mate license part of your training at um, when you went to Baltimore? Yes. And what did you think of the uh, of the training at MyTags? Um, MyTags stands for Maritime I don't Institute what it of for. Technology and Graduate Studies. There you go. Right. It's a long one. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I've I go to MyTags um, once or twice a year, 
Um, I really appreciate that facility a lot. I do wish there was, because PMI um, in Seattle is now mm -hmm. my tags uh, west, technically. Um, mm. I wish there were more, there were more classes there um, before COVID. Now they're, they downsized a lot. So I've been having to go over to the East Coast again a lot, which um, it's kind of a commute. So... Um, but I do appreciate that facility a lot because it has the hotel attached to it. Um, meals are provided. Um, the class, the classrooms are just, you know, two minute walk away. I can be in my room and then be in class in two minutes. So, so, um, for those who listen to me from the captain's chair all over the world, uh, my tags, uh, and Madeline just, uh, gave you what the letters all stand for is uh, a graduate school for uh, our uh, merchant marine officers. And it is, I think, now, Madeline, you are entitled to correct the captain gently, respectfully, and carefully. <laughs> but if I have this wrong, uh, it is funded in part by the uh, unions. Yes. Um, if you're a union trust um, mate, then... So it's it's basically they actually just change it. But if you have uh, forty two days of sea time with the union MMP um, in the last six months, then you are entitled to four weeks of classes. So the union to which uh, Madeline belongs is uh, Masters Mates and Pilots, mm -hmm. and as its name indicates, it is uh, membership is masters or captains and uh, mates. And pilots. And so now I'm going to ask you a couple pilot questions. Oh, okay. Because I have, uh, I have run um, into, first of all, you may or may not know that as a commanding officer of a Coast Guard cutter, uh, I do not have to take a pilot mm -hmm. any place in U.S. waters. Okay, cool. So, uh, and, and uh, the quid pro quo for that is that on our bridge, we usually have an, an, a, a designated navigator who is assistant and advise the commanding officer. Okay. So when we were talking about going into and out of Baltimore, which is where my tags is, um, I've been in and out of there um, many times, mm -hmm. uh, never with a pilot, mm -hmm. but uh, in some really bad, bad weather. I bet. And um, almost... Um, uh, came afoul mm. in um, in Craig Hill Reach, which is one of the dredged out channels that go into the northern part of the harbor. Okay, and uh, so so I've not had to take a pilot in any U.S. waters except when the Panama Canal belonged to us. Mm -hmm. In those days, pilots were not necessarily had never commanded. Mm. And in fact, on one transit through the Panama Canal, I drew a pilot who had never commanded. The highest he had gotten was second mate. Wow. And he then went to work for the Panama Canal Authority as a pilot, did the requisite uh, transits and training, and then became a fully fledged pilot on his own part. Wow, that's interesting. So <laughs> uh, we got uh, headed through the canal, and I'd been through uh, a number of times before that. Mm. And the Panama Canal is uh, about the best marked waterway in the world. It is incredibly well lighted at night. Mm -hmm. And the only really uh, sticky part of it is when you go through Calibra Cut. And Calibra Cut is where the uh, slides, they still slide into the, mm -hmm. into the fairway. So, um, so I was having this conversation with Pilot, and I said, uh, I said, Pilot, this seems to me to be a, a pretty easy transit. And uh, he said, but Captain, and, th and this was with the icebreaker, good size ship. Yeah. <clears throat> and, um, but no, certainly nothing like they go through today with the cruise ships, for example, or a big yeah. carrier. Yeah. And so uh, he said, but Captain, around those locks, there are secret currents lurking. <laughs> And I said, pilot, I said, don't, don't BS me mm -hmm. <laughs> about that. Um, that set the tone for the rest of the transit. And I was glad to see the stern of him when we got to the Pacific side and 
let him Secret go. Secret current. So I'd I'd be interested in um uh, your your experience with uh with pilots. Mm-hmm. Anywhere? Anywhere, yes. Okay. So um, let's let's take one who is not in a US port. Okay. Because okay. that's where I've that's where I have had uh, difficulties with pilots. And in fact, I relieved one once and told him, get off my bridge. Yeah. Um, it's definitely, <laughs> I, there's one story that specifically stands out in my head. Um, arriving in Piraeus, Greece, mm-hmm. um, the pilot was very exuberant um, and I was on the throttle uh, for arrival, he was just screaming everything. Like everything that he said was just like very aggressively screamed. Um, and he was talking about the dogs on the dock and like stay away from the dogs on the dock because they they like run in packs and at night it gets sketchy. And he's like, lady full ahead lady like screaming at me and uh, it was it was just it was a hilarious situation but that was yeah (laughs) so have you um uh, and of course when you're in a piloted situation uh at least in our ships or at least in my ships um the the captain's always on the bridge Mm -hmm. he may be sitting up in the chair but he's always on the bridge he may not have the con himself but um, uh, in merchant practice, because the manning levels are are different, mm-hmm. uh, because uh, there is required pilotage in almost every port in the world, mm-hmm. um, and there are only a few places where the pilot still retain actually acquires control of the ship, Panama Canal being one of them. But every place else, the pilot is an advisor to the captain, to the commanding officer. Yeah. Um, the evergreen ship that got herself sport ships in the Suez Canal is a great example of that, of uh, whether the captain used uh, good judgment in, in listening to the advice of his pilot. Yeah. So um, I'm not going to ask you to comment on the quality of American pilots. I have, uh, I, I have little personal experience with that because mm-hmm. I've not had to take one. But um, what I do want to ask you about, and we are running out of time so quickly here, and Ooh. I have so many things that I want to, <laughs> to talk to you about. Yeah. So maybe uh, you'd come back with me and we'd talk some more about some of these things because we're talking about things that are really interesting, not only to me personally, and it is my program after yeah, all, absolutely. but also to all the people that listen to me who are uh, maritime-related people and are very interested in this kind of thing. So I have two questions that I want to get to. I want to, first of all, ask you your opinion and your feeling about the reduced manning levels, which have been uh, more and more uh, evident as ships become more and more automated. Mm -hmm. And in particular, uh, bridge management. I know the term bridge management systems Mm -hmm. is a popular one in the merchant service. It's used by IMO, the International Maritime Exhortation, organization in london have you ever been there by the way no but it's on the list well you should go it's right near blackfriars bridge and when i was doing my uh the write-up on my thesis in cambridge at the scott polar research institute i went to the imo they have a wonderful library there so Mm. so carry on and do it okay um but uh your your thoughts about uh, manning levels and in particular bridge management that's my first question and then i'll disclose the second question when we get to it okay and we got five minutes and five minutes. that oh, is man. not nearly enough time to do all we want yeah okay so um i have been on a 16 crew vessel and i've been on a 33 crew vessel um big differences the 16 man vessel was like everyone is in the red all the time for SCCW, um, red, which is rest watch, um, rest work hours. Sorry, so that just means you're not getting enough rest by Coast Guard standards, um, and that was extremely difficult. I remember, you know, walking around the bridge on watch and walking around and trying not to fall asleep. Um, literally, you know, that's 
pretty bad. Um, so obviously it would be a lot nicer to have uh, more crew, especially if you're doing, you know, back to back arrivals and departures. Um, and if someone isn't within regulation, maybe you have another mate available to do docking or undocking. Um, that would be nice. And another thing is, um, we were discussing earlier before we came on the show, just the management of, um, keeping, um, us flagships, you know, up, um, with, you know, all the rust and degradation, um, it would be nice to have more crew to be able, you know, more day workers to just, because mm-hmm. there's only maybe two day workers. Yeah. Um, on the 16 man vessel, we had the bosun as a day worker. And wow. then the watchstanders were able to do work as they could, but, you know, but you're not able to always do day work if you're always in the red either. So that ship was absolutely horrendous, <laughs> um, rust wise, but very unsafe. Um, so yeah, it would be nice to have more day workers and, um, I don't know what the solution to that is. <laughs> um, I do, and we'll save that for a, another broadcast, mm. but my, uh, my, uh, second question to you, do you remember the, uh, the loss of El Faro? Yes. And do you remember the some of the circumstances surrounded the loss of El Faro? <clears throat> I have been in a number of uh, hurricanes in the Atlantic side and in typhoons in the Pacific side. Mm-hmm. And I know how you get around them so that, and I also know how to handle my ship so that, um, so that I don't lose her. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, her captain lost his ship. And one of the factors that got into it was um, interference by the shoreside people in the decisions that the captain made, or lack thereof, or lack thereof. <laughs> so, give me your give me your thoughts now, because you're going to be a captain. Mm-hmm. You know what my advice is to myself and to you mm. when you become a captain. What's that? The captain shall show no fear. That mm. doesn't mean you're not absolutely terrified. It means you don't show it because that works its way all the way down to the newest fireman down in the bilges cleaning out those strainers. Mm-hmm. Well. So what you're thinking about shoreside managers versus a captain fighting to save his ship in a hurricane? Well, I, I mean, the, according to what I've read, um, shoreside didn't even know where they were. They didn't know that they were in... Like, I mean, they should have been like, hey, I see, we're, we see your track going straight into this storm. What are you guys doing? Um, and regarding your advice of showing no fear, I would maybe take that in such a way um, as to, I mean, Davidson, the captain on that ship, he didn't show fear. He was an egotistical i mean there's a lot of things we could say about how he mm-hmm. handled the situation sure. um i we think we weren't there we weren't there that's right and according to the vdr um he seemed to be more complacent and i don't know if his way of showing fear was to not do anything and to disappear off the bridge and not come back and um i think you know, being a captain, it's important to say, you know, this is a scary situation. This is terrifying for everyone. And um, acknowledge to your crew that this is terrifying and that we need to work together as opposed to like, we're fine, we're fine, everything's fine, Um, carry on. Um, So we have uh, far too quickly come to the end of our time. I am not even going to give my usual uh, wishes, desires, and commands from the captain's chair, except to say everybody that um, take care of each other as the week goes by. We'll meet here once again next week. This is your Captain Joe up in the captain's chair on station and watching properly. 
We never say goodbye. We say until we meet again. And Madeline, mate Madeline, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. And we're going to uh, get together once again because we've got lots of things to talk about (laughs) for this particular group. You're listening to Voice of Vashon, your island connection at 101.9 FM, KVSHLP Vashon.